to the community. And so we have a table in the back set up, but we're going to be helping some local kids. Um, I can't stress it well enough. So I've actually invited somebody up, uh, my buddy Josh. Uh, he's been coming for over a year now. Look at this handsome guy. Come on up. So I was like, I think we need to bring out the big guns this year. And I said, Josh, are you ready to bring the big guns? And he was like, give me the mic. And I was like, oh, yeah. So he's actually going to share his story. It might cut, un cut into the sermon time, and I told him that's okay. If he wants to preach this thing all the way through, that doesn't bother me at all. So I want you guys to put your hands together for my buddy Josh. He's going to share why we're giving. Thank you. Um, I just want to say that I'm extremely excited that we're doing this. We're talking about kids who live in group homes that are going to go to foster care. I'm a group home kid who went to foster care. Um, I'll say right away that I was blessed with my foster parents because they eventually adopted me. Um, eventually, I was 35. Um, <laughs> true story. So, but uh, better late than never, and it felt good nonetheless. Um, I say that to say that I do know what these kids are going through. Life is, life is hard for these kids. Because it's not normal. Um, you're not going to friend's house after school. Nobody's coming over. While the other kids were worried about the test coming up or finishing a project, I was worried that they would realize I wear the same shirt two, three times a week. When I got to this last group home, my entire world fit in one bag. All I owned were the clothes on my back and another outfit. So when you see items on the list that are like underwear and socks, and you might think that's insignificant, but when you only have two pairs of socks that you're rotating between, a pack of socks means a lot. When you have nothing, the little things become big things. Life is tough for these kids, especially around the holidays. Now I know usually around this time the holiday movies come out and it's normal that families have the movies that they watch around these times every year, and that's great. And believe it or not, I watched some of those same movies, but they had a, a different meaning. When I would watch some of these movies, it was just a, a reminder of everything my life wasn't. Understand that no one's debating over what theme tree we're putting up this year. No one's arguing over who gets to put the star on top. There, there is no star. Even worse, after Christmas break, the kids go back to school, and what do they do? They usually talk about their gifts, right? And this is normal. I remember I, I would lie about my gifts because I guess I, I, I was too embarrassed to say I didn't get anything. Um, that's why I think the, the gift cards are a great idea. Uh, some of the purchases from the gift cards are going to go to get these kids gifts. And then I also hear that maybe when we get closer to the holiday, uh, we might get some wish lists for these kids, which I think, and I hope we do, because it's just another opportunity to get involved and make sure these kids wake up to something. And we all know it's not about the gifts. But in this world, it means something different. It's not just a gift. It's almost, it's almost like a symbol of love. Uh, someone took time out of their day, money out of their pocket, to get you something. Someone thought about you. And that, that means a lot for the kids who often get forgotten about. My foster mom was my teacher. I went to uh, Hillcrest. If you don't know what Hillcrest is, if you get kicked out of Kenosha Public Schools, you go to Hillcrest. Um, and that's where I met her. And I remember I asked her why she did what she did. Because we didn't have a great like, teacher-student relationship. In fact, I, I got caught stealing items from her desk before. Um, she never had foster kids before or since, so I needed to know why. And she had explained that once a week they do a meeting about the kids and their situations and what was going on. I just got done doing 60 days in juvenile detention. I was to do 90 days at this group home, and then it was off to foster care. Uh, there was no more going home for me. And I, I told her, I get the how, but the why. And she said when she heard that I was going to foster care, she volunteered to take me. Even though her coworkers were like, we're not looking for volunteers, we're just explaining the situation. And she said she did that because God told her to take me. 
I get it now. I promise I do. But at the time, I, I, get, I, did, I didn't get it. I, I was confused. I couldn't wrap my head around that answer. Uh, for, for, first off, who has that kind of faith? I mean, you're at work in the middle of a meeting, you hear a call and you answer it. And not just a little call, we're talking about taking on a kid when you have three kids of your own. Not just any kid, uh, a kid with issues. You know he's gonna give you problems. And regrettably, I did. The second thing that I couldn't understand is if what she's saying is true, why would God care that much about some poor kid from the streets? who up until this point in his life didn't do anything good for anybody. I didn't, I didn't deserve what was happening to me. Understand, uh, you didn't know one plus one equal two until someone taught it to you, until someone showed you. They were like, hey, here's an apple. Look, it's another apple. Two apples, right? The same thing goes for some of these kids in God. They don't know that Jesus loves them that much. I didn't know. They didn't know that God has a purpose and a plan for them, and that the worst part of the journey becomes the best part of the testimony. I didn't know. And without some sort of examples, without some type of messenger, some of these kids will never get that message. If you think about it, a puzzle ain't nothing but a bunch of little pieces working together to provide a bigger picture, a bigger purpose. So I just encourage us to be a puzzle piece for this group home. I encourage us to be a puzzle piece for these kids because I hate to think of the type of man I would be today if it wasn't for the puzzle pieces in my life. I'm gonna hand things back over to Jason. Um, thank you guys. Yeah, I got to follow that <laughs> with prayer. Let's bow our heads for a minute, you guys. Lord, we want to thank you for Josh. We want to thank you for his testimony. We want to thank you for the road that you've led him down that's brought him to this point. God, I pray that we would hear you clearly like his mom did. God, that we would just tune our ears into your spirit to your sweet voice. God, that this would be more than another holiday season. It would be more than just a regular Christmas. But God, we would truly find a way to connect with you on a level that impacts eternity. So for each one in this room, each one listening right now, Lord, I just pray that you would provide wisdom, provide discernment, Lord, and provide blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Man, I'm crying before I'm preaching. How about Josh? Should we get him up here again sometime? And you were nervous they weren't going to like you. Good-looking guy over there. Who's not going to like that? All right. Well, I just want to say good morning and thank you all for joining us. Thank you to everybody that's joining us online. Uh, we got a a good problem that we've run into. We're getting too full. Man, I keep, yeah. Last Sunday was in the top five fullest Sundays of the year. So you're showing up. But what's even better, and this is kind of funny, I don't recognize all of you. We got new faces coming in here. One of the greatest things you can have in your church is not knowing everybody when you're trying to know everybody. So to all of you that are new, that you're visiting, I just want to introduce myself. I am Jason. I'm the associate pastor here. Uh, this week, I will be filling in for Pastor Dan. So it's kind of a weird thing. If you are starting off listening to me, he's different. I'm different. Somebody that says, we work well together. So if you're like, eh, Jason was okay, come back for Dan. If you love me, you're, you're going to love Pastor Dan. Um, so I'm filling in for him because... He's not here. He got the week off. Pastor Dan has preached a record number of Sundays in a row, so he definitely deserved to just relax this Thanksgiving. If you heard his sermon last week, you understand, like, that was a sermon that could last two weeks. You, you deserve the week off, buddy. 
Uh, so he's also taken his oldest son back to college. So that's a big blessing. He's able to do that. And church is in good hands. we got a great staff. we got a great team taking care of everything. So, uh, But I felt it was important to acknowledge this accomplishment for Pastor Dan. As you guys know, he sits to preach. Um, something you don't see on the outside is while he's calm, cool, and collected, his heart rate is in a free fall. Sometimes he's up here at 160 miles an hour in his chest, but he's playing it cool. So he, you know, getting up here each week, it's a workout for him. And we get the blessing from the work that he's putting in. Uh, and so what I wanted to do is uh, I, I gave them a gift, him and Suzanne, because she is absolutely a huge part of the equation. He can't be Dan without Suzanne. Amen. Yeah, so I stopped by their house last night, and I dropped them off a, a gift, and on that gift, there was a scripture, and it is one of my favorite scriptures in the entire Bible, and I'm going to share it with you because that would be rude not to. Uh, Acts chapter 14, starting with verse 19, then some Jews arrived from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowds to their side. They stoned Paul and dragged him out of town. That is not the part of the scripture I wanted him to hold on to. <laughs> like, don't worry, dude. We're not bringing rocks to church. Um, so they drag him. <laughs> you got to admit, if I started reading that about you, you'd be like, I left my shield at home. What am I thinking? So they dragged him out of town, thinking he was dead. But as the believers gathered around him, he got up and went back into the town. And then the next day, he left with Barnabas. Uh, for Derby. So in one moment, this crowd thought Paul was a god. They were like, this guy, what he's doing, he's got to be a god. And then some dudes showed up, turned the crowd against him. They all stone him till they think he's dead, and they throw him outside of the city. But he got back up and went into town. And so on his, I got him a, a Stanley cup. You guys ever heard of a Stanley mug? Yeah. If you, if you haven't, get one. And if you know somebody that wants one for their birthday or Christmas, get them one. They'll love you because they're just that good. Uh, so I got him one of those. And on it, it says, back in town. And it's got Acts 14, 20. I was like, that's pretty cool. I like that. So that way when people ask, you can tell the story of, yeah, no matter what stones are thrown my way, no matter how many times I get beat down, I'm getting back up and I'm going in until God tells me I'm done. And that is absolutely, you, you can clap for that. And that is absolutely the heart of our pastor. He never shows it on the outside, but you know he's, he's fighting on the inside, but he just keeps going. Suzanne, the same way. Nothing has slowed them down one bit. A lot of people would have called it quits a long time ago. So as a church, as the well, if you are visiting with us, we are a blessed congregation because of the pastor that we've been blessed with. All right. So what I'd like to encourage you guys to do is this week, if you haven't done this recently, reach out to Dan and Suzanne and just... Shoot them a little extra love. Send them a text message. You know, do the usual thing. Just let them know, hey, I'm thinking about you and I'm praying for you. That would mean the world to them. Can you do that? Yeah, cool. All right. So those of you that know me pretty well, you know I have a highly addictive personality. If I eat one cookie, I eat the whole box. Do I got any, I got any others in here with me? Yeah, you're raising both hands. I love that. It just shows the extra mile. Um, <laughs> So since I gave Dan and Suzanne a gift, I was like, well, I might as well give away four more gifts, right? Okay, so let's do that. So here's the rule. Uh, if you know the answer, please raise your hand, and I will call on you. Does that sound good? We all remember this from school. I have a lovely assistant. Would you guys like to see her? Yeah. yeah. Lovely assistant, if you would come up here. She's going to help me watch for whose hands go up first. Extra clap. Just give them all the gifts. They were so sweet. I'm just kidding. All right, so first question, and I'm looking for a raise of hands. Danielle, my beautiful wife, will you help keep an eye out for whose hand goes up first? All right. Who celebrated their 90th birthday with us this month? Davon? Dave. Dave. Davon, you get the gift. And once again, happy birthday, Dave. We love you, brother. All right, next question. You might want to look on this side of the room for this one, honey. All right. Uh, who turned 47 this month? You got it. Sharon got it. 
Now, I would like to say I was looking this way because I assumed Dan's mom was going to raise her hand. <laughs> but she's like, no, I'm going to give her two. She can have it. <laughs> yeah, Marita, you are so sweet. All right, here's a tough one. Who turns 16 years old today? Oh, I think it was, was it Amy or Liv that, okay, Amy did it first. Um, Olivia. Olivia, our bass player. <laughs> Happy sweet 16, Liv. And I'm going to give you a gift of not singing to you. You're welcome. All right. And now let's, uh, let's do a really, really easy one. Who wrote the book of Philippians? Oh, Karen. Paul. Now make sure you don't open your gift until Christmas. Just kidding. Open it now because that's how I am. I cannot give a gift and be like, just wait. No. You get a gift, you open it now. Amen? Amen. All right, so you guys can open those. Mm. Who loves that sound? And we went all out. It's double-sided wrapping paper. All right, so we are closing up our series today with Philippians chapter 4. Everybody say Philippians chapter 4. All right, we have four gifts for four, chapter 4. Uh, some call it the coffee cup chapter. I call it the Hobby Lobby chapter. All these gifts that you guys have received are not just Philippians, but they are Philippians chapter 4. If Paul could come back today, do you think he would, how do you think he would feel walking into a Hobby Lobby and seeing all his inspirational words? I feel like he'd probably walk in there and be like, I have not seen a dime of royalties. Who do I sue? No, if we know Paul, we know that'd be the furthest thing from his mind. I think he'd be honored to know that while your words were intended for a specific audience, they were so impacting, they have been repeated countless times over hundreds of years. Paul's words did not die with him. Is that amazing or what? That has got to be one of the greatest feelings you could possibly have. As a parent, I think the greatest thing is to hear your kids say something like this. It's like you said, Dad. And then they actually repeat something that you said that you wanted them to remember. That's the trick. You wanted them to remember. Knowing that something that you said stuck with your kid is the best feeling ever. God wants Scripture to stick with us. I mean, that is why this book has been the number one bestseller forever. Uh, something I like to do when I'm going through Scripture to help it stick, and I'm going to give you my, my tips and tricks. And I've shared this before, but I want to give it to you guys again because I think it's a good reminder. I like to ask a few questions while I'm going through the Word. Number one is who, then why, then how, and then Jason. <laughs> so say your name and turn your head to the side with one eyebrow up. And Jason? Yeah? Okay. So who is writing this, and who are they writing to? That's important. Why? Well, why is why? That's why we're reading it. <laughs> How does this apply today? And Jason, <laughs> what does this mean for me? How should I respond? Because if you read the Word of God and you don't feel you need to respond, did you really read the Word of God? We are a part of this story. It's been left for us. This morning, as we go through this brief, beautiful, amazing chapter, I want you to ask yourself those questions. But most importantly, what does this mean for me? I want you to put yourself into this. Make it personal. So the first question is, who? Dan already taught us this week, or this series, that Philippians was written by Paul. Thank you, Karen, for paying attention. She nailed it. To the church of Philippi. Philippians, Philippi. Huh, that's an easy one. Here's a little-known fact that drastically changes the way that we read Paul's letters. When Paul wrote a letter to a church, it was customary to read it out loud. That changes things drastically. So remember last week when Dan gave the illustration of if he went to jail and then I had to take over and you guys booed? Um, I, my feelings weren't hurt. I would have booed too. Uh, now imagine, imagine that he's in jail and he writes a letter to us and then every week I get up and I have to read those words aloud to you. Okay? 
Y'all know Dan. Dan's a very busy guy. You see what he can come up with when he's busy. Now imagine him in a jail cell with nothing to do but think about us and be creative and then write us a letter with no filter. Meet Paul. All right. Now you guys got this. So keep that in mind anytime you're reading Paul's letter. And uh, I found that this really helps me to understand something. It helps me understand Paul, but it actually helps me understand who the audience is and what's going on at the time. So the next question, why? Well, to answer that, we need to actually get into the letter, and don't worry, we will. But why would Paul write to a church hundreds of miles away from his jail cell? It has to mean something. Paul's letters to the other churches were, I would say, a bit rough at times, and for a lot of reasons, and most commonly is because they got off course for some reason. And his letters were usually blunt, and there to straighten them out in as few words as possible. He didn't pat any egos. He just came straight at it. He's like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to write another one. So, boom, here it is. Let me give it to you. But this letter is different. Paul loved this church differently. I read Philippians like I would read a letter from my grandpa to his kids and to his grandkids. Uh, my last Christmas with my grandpa before he went to be with the Lord, uh, it was... It was awesome. We were sitting at my aunt's house, and it was kind of, things were wrapping up, and we were getting ready to pack up and go, and my aunt's like, no, you're not going, and you listen to auntie. So when she tells you to stay, especially when she's your little Italian aunt, you, oh, you definitely listen. So we stuck around, and she gave us a huge gift, because that's when my grandpa just opened up. We got to sit around. It was, like I said, it was his last Christmas, and he just told story after story after story, and the best part of it is we were left with joy and love from what he had to say. That's a gift you can't get back, you know. That was just an incredible moment, and I feel like Paul is doing the same thing here in this letter. Uh, from the beginning of Philippians, and we already went through this, but Philippians chapter 1 verse 3, I thank my God every time I remember you. It's like he's saying, man, I'm I'm stuck in jail and it sucks, but man, I love you guys. Can you imagine that? Like, out of sight, out of mind? No. I'm having a terrible day and I'm just happy thinking about you. That's an amazing thing for Paul to write. And then all the way over to chapter 4, Philippians 4, verse 1. Therefore, my brothers, you whom I love and long for. When you're in jail, there's probably a lot of things that you long for. But the company of your friends, when you specify who they are, that's meaningful. You whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. Paul is closing this letter to the Philippians, and he uses this term crown. And usually you think about like royalty, but this the word that they use here in Hebrew, it doesn't, it's not the royalty crown. It is a crown of achievement, like you have won something, and it is, it's your trophy. And he's saying that to these guys. You guys are the trophy of my ministry. And if you know what Paul's ministry is like, you know that this is a big deal to know that we have made it worth it for him. He's making an extremely personal connection with the church. I may not be there in body, but you guys have my heart. That's a beautiful sentiment. So to be clear, Paul is not going to waste words here because he's writing from prison. He's on borrowed time. He knows that what's written on this scrap of parchment could be his last words to these guys. So he's got to make it count. So as we read that, we got to understand the gravity of why he's writing this. This could be a dying man's last words. That's a big why. So for you note takers, I titled this message, From Content to to content, from content to content. If these are Paul's last words to a church he loves, he's going to leave the secret to his happiness, his joy, and the secret to contentness in life. So if any of that stuck out to you, pay attention. Who here could go for a little peace, joy, and contentment right now? For those of you that don't need it, share your secret with somebody after church. <laughs> 
But today I'm going to give you Paul's. Paul teaches us in this chapter that the, the way to being content comes from the content of what's inside or what we are allowing inside of our hearts and minds. That's a big deal. So the first example, let's start right off Philippians chapter 4, verse 2. I plead with Eodia and I plead with Syntyche. If you're looking for baby names, there they are. Look no further. <laughs> My man. <laughs> so I plead with you to be the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my coworkers whose names are in the book of life. So let's go back to Dan in jail. It's a fun story. Why is Dan in jail? I figured it out. He's in jail for preaching too hard and looking too good while he's doing it is now a jailable offense. So Dan writes a letter to the well. And I get up and I start reading the letter. Here it is. He didn't really write this. This is me. So I don't want him getting credit for it. Uh, Dear well family and Donna. Um, I'm just kidding. You know he would have. You know that's how he would have. That's not me. That was Dan. All right. You guys are my crowning achievement. LOL. Lots of love. He said that in a sermon. That's why I threw that in there. I plead with Amy A and I plead with Amy M to agree that they both make great chocolate chip cookies. You both have baked so many cookies for the kingdom. Your name is in the book of life. That's not theologically accurate, but just for the story. So stop hating. P.S. Since you've been fighting and haven't been baking, Dr. Chris popped by prison to bring me his fresh baked chocolate chip cookies. Sincerely, Pastor Dantastic. This didn't really happen. But that's what happens in church. People start fighting over silly things. It's those little things that cause the cracks for the foundation to crumble. So whatever was going on with Eodia and Syntyche was a big enough deal for Paul to call them out in front of everybody at the beginning of the chapter. Like, let's just go right after this, guys. As Christians, you really can't be content if the content of your heart is bitterness towards other believers. How are we going to show love to the lost if we can't get along? I mean, Paul is just like, I got one, one line left or right. Here it is. Stop it. If you got a problem with a fellow believer, just talk to them. Get it behind you. And here's what Paul does, though, because that's an incredibly difficult thing to do, amen? So he tells the church, get behind them, give them a hand, help them out. Don't stick your head in the sand. Be there for them while they get through this. Let's put it out in the light so God can take care of it, amen? Because it, it is too easy to turn your back, stick your head in the sand, but that's not going to lead to contentment. And Paul follows his pleading with these ladies with a command. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. It is so important, he repeats it. And I believe Paul is saying the cure for conflict amongst believers is to take joy in the Lord. Because I believe if you can truly delight in the creator, it will be that much easier to love his creation. If you really love God and what God is doing and he makes you happy, it's going to be hard to hate his creation. But Paul sneaks something in here that I think is so important, and, you know, we're just humans. We read through things quickly. And this one really stood out in bold words to me, and it was the word always. He says always. And whenever we see always or never, I think it's a very important thing to slow down because that is a critical word. If you're supposed to do something all of the time or absolutely never, that is a big deal. So here's what he does. Actually, I'm going to back up for a second. Let's, let's grind this in a little bit more. For example, if you heard somebody say, never do drugs. How many of you guys grew up with the say no to drugs, the D.A.R.E. program and stuff? And it was like, oh, okay, yeah, you see it a lot. Um, the phrase, never do drugs from a recovering addict, means never, ever, ever, ever do drugs. Somebody who has had a life devastated by the abuse of drugs is never ever going to tell you that it's okay to test it. Maybe it'll be better for you. 
They're never going to say, give it a shot. I hope it works out for you. Their never means it is not an option. So we listen to them. What if somebody says, hey, always tell your mom you love her? That's a nice sentiment. But if somebody says that to you who has lost their mom, it means something completely different. It means you tell your mom every chance you get what she means to you. And in fact, I feel so passionately about that. If you want to take your phone out right now and you have a parent or a loved one that you think, oh, man, I better tell them I love them. I haven't said it in a while. Do it now. That's one of those you just don't wait on because you know you do that always because when they are gone, then it becomes you don't ever get to do that again. And that's a big deal. And I think that that is why Paul is using that verbiage. Paul says, always rejoice in the Lord because through the stonings, the beatings, being left for dead and shipwrecked and imprisoned and being abandoned by friends, rejoicing in the Lord has been the key to being content where he should have been defeated. That is why Paul is saying, always rejoice in the Lord. Remember, these are his, if this was my last words to you, chapter, right? So we know that we need to prioritize what Paul is saying here. Um, when I first started at my job, uh, I'd hear people complain about different things. I don't know if your employer company has that, people that complain. No, is that just mine? Okay. Um, <laughs> and when I went in there, I was like, I'm starting fresh. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a decision not to go there. I'm not going to join the complain train. I'm just going to stay off of it. And I decided I would, I would just focus on the good things. Somebody starts talking bad, I'm going to be like, yeah, but you know what? We got this. So I'm going to counter those complaints with some compliments, right? And I've been there for a year and a half now, and it really is a great place to work. But two weeks ago, man, I slipped down the slippery slope of complaining. I can't believe I said that without spitting. <laughs> so I, I did it, man. I, I fell down. I was like, man, this blah, 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 blah. And I was just like, and I could hear myself doing it. Like it would come out loud. You're like, shh. And then you complain again. I'm like, what is this? I have it. Again, the addictive personality. So you start complaining, it's contagious. And then, so I was having that week, and then Pastor Dan starts preaching, and he passes out the bracelets. Every time you complain, you switch wrists, and he killed it. I mean, it was such a good sermon. If you didn't hear last week's Thanksgiving sermon, go back, listen to it. Find your coworker that complains a lot, just accidentally text it to them, but whoops, maybe you should listen to this. Just do it. It was so good. So I, it was so good, in fact, I took bracelets with me to work, and I was like, I think you need this. <laughs> I love you. Put this on. And when you complain, switch wrists. And I, a few of my coworkers, I'd walk in, like, midway through the week, and they're like, and I'm like, oh, cool. I'm like, is that the wrist that started on? They're like, you just be glad I'm wearing it. <laughs> but that was the deal. You switch wrists every time you complain. And I had to switch wrists a couple times this week, but I was very conscientious of it. So I had renewed my, my passion for not complaining, and I reminded myself, Jason, always speak positive and battle the complaining. It is a battle. This is a literal fight. So rejoice always and always rejoice. We have to fight for this. So continuing on in the pursuit of contentment, we got verse 6. If you're taking notes, sharpen your pencil. Here we go. Do not be anxious about anything. When somebody tells you that, you go, ha, <laughs> what do you know? You don't know my life. Paul doesn't know your life. Paul knows his life. But if somebody tells you this, you better hope that they are going to back up their words, and Paul delivers. Do not be anxious about any, anything, but in every, that's in there with always and never, every situation, by prayer and petition, that's talking to God, with thanksgiving, we're going to turbocharge it. We're going to put something next to it that's even more powerful. With thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God. Who wants the peace of God? 
Well, you just read the thing that'll get it to you, right? All right. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Oh, man. That is such a big verse. Does your mind need protection? Does your heart need protection? He just showed you how God's going to do it if you'll do this part of it. It's the I you I do, then he'll do scripture. So we've got our part to play in this. This is not a cheat code to a perfect life. I hate when people are like, all you got to do. No. <laughs> This is a reminder that in every situation, not just in what you deem worthy, but in every situation, put it in God's hands. Don't wait and use it as a last resort. Don't wait till your anxiety is sky high and then pray. Do it first before it even starts. So I got to take a second, you guys. Remember when I was saying you got to tell your mom you love her while you can? I'm going to brag about my mom for a minute. You okay, you okay with that? Yeah. yeah. That's my mom right over there. If you didn't know, wave, everybody. Hey, Miss Sherry. Um, so my mom has been my Paul. She's given it to me straight my whole life, and I really appreciate her for that. And as a kid, I struggled with anxiety so bad. As a kid, I didn't even know what I was struggling with. I just knew that I was having a hard time. And... This is what's so cool. Even now as an adult, I can still hear her words in her voice in my head. If you're taking notes, write this down. These aren't my words. These are my mom's words, so you know they're really good. Worry is the advanced price you pay for something that may never happen. They say like 85% of what you worry about will never happen to you. Okay. The other thing she would say. If it's worth worrying about, it's worth praying about. And the one that I think has helped me the most in my life from the time I was a little kid all the way through being an adult is this. When you were scared or overwhelmed. Anybody here ever get scared or overwhelmed? All right, I'm going to give you Miss Sherry's big one right here. Ready? Speak the name of Jesus. Speak the name of Jesus. You don't even have to say it out loud. Speak it in your head. Speak it over and over. Just say his name. As a kid, there was such a peace that came with saying the name of Jesus. Man, I think if, if these were my last words to you guys, I would be giving you my mom's. <laughs> I, I'm not even going to lie. If, if this is the only thing that I could tell you guys would be those three things. Take them with you. They've been so important through my life. If it's worth worrying about, it's worth praying about. Worry is the advance price you pay for something that may never happen. And when you're scared and overwhelmed, speak the name of Jesus. Yeah. Thanks, Mom. It just, yeah. I don't know if you knew it was a big deal, but it was a big deal. But Paul says it so plain. You can have a peace that does not make sense when you give it over to God in prayer. And I think that's the best way to, for him to put it. It's like this passes understanding. And this is one of those where you don't know until you know. This is one of those that you have to experience it to understand it. All right. So you can have peace that will pass all understanding when you give it over to God in prayer. And then we got verse 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. So when will the God of peace be with you? When you put it into practice. When will the God of peace be with you? When you put it into practice, you see our part, like we have something to do, and he makes it clear. It's like, put it into practice. Don't just listen, do it. If your mind is a battlefield, who is winning? Or better yet, who is fighting for it? If you don't know this, the enemy wants your mind. Why? Because it sends out orders to the rest of the body. 
Take the mind and you'll own the body. You have to fight for your mind. You do. Everything Paul's given us right now is, that's the ammunition. Science has discovered that the part of the brain that produces anxiety also produces gratitude. It's a battle. Paul knows this. Paul sat in a prison cell and started a worship service. Why? That doesn't make any sense to us, right? Because he knew that was the way to keep his thoughts on whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, and anything that is excellent or praiseworthy. Nobody is going to do that for you. We have an incredible worship director. She works very hard to lead us each and every week in worship with songs that focus our mind and our hearts on God, but she can't make us do it. She provides the tools. She does an excellent job, but she can't make you go there with your mind and with your heart. It's up to us. We need to think of these thoughts as fuel for the fire of contentment. You want to be content? You want to throw a log on the fire? Think good thoughts. You do it. Nobody's doing it for you. And the last one we have is my absolute favorite part of chapter 4, verse 4, 11 through 13. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content in whatever the circumstances. He's just confessing it. I'm content no matter what. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in every, in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. I can be content because God is strong enough to get me through. All the things that I have encouraged you to do These are the reasons why I can be content in hard times, is what Paul is saying. This is the secret recipe. Because I make peace with other believers. Because I rejoice constantly. I reject anxiety by giving it all to God in prayer with a thankful heart. I deliberately focus on things that are excellent and praiseworthy. God has given me the strength and the confidence to do all the things I have done, and my soul is content. I call Philippians 4.13 the 10-finger prayer. Hold your hand up. Everybody got your hands up. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. You know the 10-finger prayer. Now, I know for myself, when when I face things, I know I'm not strong enough to handle. He shows up. Man, Time after time, I don't know how I got through it. Yeah, I do. It was God. When I survive what should have beaten me, I know why. It's him. When I share my my story and I share my testimony, any strength that I appear to have is the strength he's given me. It's not my own doing. Uh, Worship team, you guys can come back up. It all goes back to God, and Paul's saying it. It's like, you guys, this is, this is it. And I think he would be honest and say, I didn't come up with this. This is what God has led me to, and I'm sharing it with you guys. And, man, we zipped through this, but I hope you guys looked at it with an open heart. I hope you did, like I said earlier, and I hope you put your name in there. And you said, how does this impact me? My prayer is if you're struggling to know peace, or you would flat out say, I'm not content, Go back this this week and read Philippians chapter 4. Meditate on it. And as soon as I said that, and I was thinking to myself and I was writing this, I was like, meditate, yeah. Maybe medicate. Maybe we need to look at this as a prescription that will get us the healing that we need. Because we all have an ache or a pain or some type of physical problem. And if somebody had already taken something that cured them and they said, you have to do this every day, would you take that every day? We know the answer is yes, because there are weight loss pills out there that people take (laughs) on a regular basis that do nothing. Sorry. (laughs) Like we all know, we've tried everything. But Paul is saying this has literally worked. This literally works. So maybe we look at the Word of God as medication. 
We let the Word of God be our source of healing. And here's the beautiful part about it. It's free. To experiment with this will cost you nothing. And this could literally be the thing that you have been needing to find contentment. What I think is important to realize is, though Paul wrote this to the Philippians, this letter is for us. It's literally a step-by-step practical guide on how to change the content to become content. So I'm going to pray. The worship team is going to close us out in one more song. Jesus, we want to thank you so much for your word. We want to thank you for the words of Paul that have survived this many years to speak to us today. And Lord, we pray that we won't take them for granted, that we will hide your heart. Yeah that we'll hide your word in our heart, that we won't sin against it. So we just pray for each one here, Lord, that you would bring them peace, that you would bring them joy, and that you would bring them contentment as they pursue you, as they put your words into action. In Jesus' name, amen.